pressing the record. Okay, so um, I just had another study session with my other class and the what we did in that was we just went over the um, the expectations for the exam, but also we went over the questions for the exam as well. Um, those have not yet been made available to students. They will be as soon as the study session is over. So, um, but since there's just one person here, um, uh, and do, do you have a, a, a video? Do you feel comfortable putting your video camera on? If you don't, that's okay. But if you feel comfortable putting your video camera on, it'd be nice to. No, sorry, I don't have a video camera. Okay. That's the whole situation, I never really got the chance to buy one because a lot of people have been buying them out near me. Yes, right. I heard there was a run on them. So that's fine. I just thought I'd ask. Um, so do you want to go over the expectations for the exam or, or do you feel kind of, um, I mean, the expectations for this exam are not that different from the expectations for the, um, the midterm exam, but we can put it up on the screen if you want to go over it. Or do you just want to go right in to take a look at the questions? It's probably a good idea to put up the expectations because okay. not everyone is here to answer for that. Yeah, sure. Um, so here's our class. So, oh, first thing I need to do is I need to share my screen. So hold on just for a second. All right, share screen. All right, are you able to see the screen? I can see it just fine. Okay, cool. So let me, uh, you know, scroll down here uh, to final exam. So here's the final exam information and study session. So the final exam is um, you'll get access it, to it today at 2 p.m. And the the final exam is worth a lot. I mean, it's worth 200 points. So 20% of your final course grade, um, it covers all of the material that we've done since midterm exam. And so that is from police all the way to corrections. And then there are six questions on the exam. And then like we did for the midterm exam, you select four of those questions to answer. And then, um, you know, I, I always hesitate to give students like a um, length of exam because it's like, answer the questions fully using evidence from course material to support your points. But they're like, no, tell me how long it should be. So, um, you know, about two pages double spaced for each question, a total of eight double spaced pages for the total exam. Uh, if it comes in like less than that, a few pages less, that's fine. A little bit more, that's fine. But as I always tell my students, I mean, if you're answering the question and you're answering it in less than a page, you probably need to go back and make sure that you are supplementing, making sure that you're using enough evidence from the course materials to support the points that you um, hold on just for a second. Sorry about that. All right, can you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. And so- um, My dog wants attention right now too. I know, it's like every time during the semester when I would start doing voiceover PowerPoint slides, it was like the dog's cue to start barking. They'd be quiet all day and I'd like start recording. They'd be like, wah, wah, wah. Um, So uh, that, you know, what I'm really looking for in the exam is that you answer all the prompts in the essay question, okay? Um, and that you answer them in a way that demonstrates you understand the course material. Um, as well, when we take a look at the questions in a second, there's always a critical thinking question prompt. And a lot of times students just throw that away. They, they just really don't take time to like actually make an argument in answer to the critical thinking prompt. Um, and so make sure that you don't do that, okay? Um, I expect you to pull on all the course material, whether that's lectures, textbook, um, the articles that we've read, you can use the locked in book. Um, so the best exams won't just use only textbook information or only lecture information, but they are basically um, using all of the course material, but obviously you don't need to do it for each answer, right? I mean, it's just like taken as a whole. Um, and then, you know, make sure you proofread and then um, you don't need to use any external sources, um, those are not necessary. 
but that when you're using sources and if you do use external sor sources, um, you want to make sure that you properly cite them. And then I have some examples there uh, for how to cite the, the, uh, the textbook and other course material. So uh, do you have any questions on the expectations for the exam? Um, no, I think I understand the expectations fine. Yeah, they're pretty straightforward. Plus, they're very similar to the expectations for the for the midterm exam. All right, let's take a look at the questions. And so let me pull the questions up here. OK, so you get these questions today, right after the study session. And then you have until Monday um, at 11.59 at 11 PM to turn those in, OK? Uh, like our. Uh, midterm exam, there are six questions here and that you answer four of them of your choice, okay? And so let's go over the questions and then we'll do each question and then we'll, I'll see if you have any um, questions about the question. We'll go one by one. Does that work for you? Yes, that should be fine. Okay. Going over each question. Yes, yeah, so the first question is about the Fourth Amendment. So uh, one, one of the things I'm, I'm trying not to double up on like our discussion posts and then asking like a question from our discussion post in the exam. And so I'm trying to like make sure that we're assessing new inf like information that hasn't been assessed in a different way, okay? So we're not focusing on chapter seven, uh, the, the that COPS uh, about sort of issues facing policing because we did that in one of our discussion posts. But here we're gonna focus on chapter eight, which is has to do with the fourth amendment search and seizure. And so the question is, the Fourth Amendment states that the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable search and seizure, seizure shall not be violated. So I'm asking you, like, what does that mean? Um, in class, we talked about, like, what constitutes a search. And so I want you to tell me what is a search, what makes a search unreasonable, and do police need to have a warrant for a search to be considered reasonable? Hint, they don't. Um, cops are allowed to conduct searches. There's exceptions to the need for a warrant that are constitutional. And so explain um, those instances where it's okay to search without a warrant. And then I want you to select two cases, Fourth Amendment cases from chapter eight that you found to be particularly interesting. So as you were, as you were reading about search and seizure, like were there any cases where you were like, whoa, I can't believe the court ruled in this way, or wow, I really agree with that opinion. Or you just thought it was an interesting facts of the case. And so describe each case, include the decision of the court. Um, and then uh, what do these cases tell us about the fourth amendment? And do you agree with how the court decided this case, okay? So those are the, you know, those, those final prompts, those are the critical thinking prompts, okay? There's no right or wrong answer to those, but it's um, that, you know, it's how you sort of support why you thought it was interesting. And also, I mean, I guess it's right in terms of like whether or not you got the decision of the court correct that, you know, that's, that's you know, there's a right answer for that. Um, but what it tells us about the Fourth Amendment there, you know, you can, you know, use your, like your knowledge of the Fourth Amendment to um, make the connection between that and the case. So that's that question. What do you think? Any questions about that question? Uh, no, I think I understand that. And let me just clarify, what was the length that you said that these would have to be again, or like a page you said? And if it's below a page, you probably should go back and supplement more of your uh, uh, argument. Uh, I mean, I think ideally two pages, um, double space typed is, you know, ballpark. I've had excellent answers that are less than that. Um, a lot more than that gets on my nerves because like you don't need to tell me everything you know about the Fourth Amendment, right? Um, that's part of the like exam process is being able to differentiate between like the most important information and not feel this need to just like list everything that's in the tax textbook. But yeah, a minimum of a page, uh, but probably more than a page is what it would take to actually answer that question, I think, adequately. Does that help? Yes, I believe it helps. Okay, question two is about the court system. And so, um, you know, this question is asking you to describe the structure and purpose of the court system in the United States. And so there's a whole lecture and obviously the textbook dedicated to talking about, um, you know, how the court system in the United States is organized. Um, for this, you could, if you want to like draw or diagram, I've had students when we, I used to teach this in, face to face, I mean, students, they could, you know, like do, draw a diagram of the court system. And so you can do that and you can, but it ha needs to be hand created, labeled, and you could insert that into your answer if, if creating a visual helps you 
describe the structure and purpose of the, the court system. Um, what you need to take into consideration is, um, you know, we talked about the role that federalism and federal supremacy play in how our court system is organized. There's a federal side, there's a state side, but the most, but the, the court of last resort is the Supreme Court of the United States. So you want to keep that in mind. Um, how are federal courts different from state courts? And then I want you to describe the purpose and function of the three types of courts we talked about, trial, appellate, and Supreme Courts. And this is the critical thinking question of these three courts, which do you think is most essential to realizing criminal justice and why? And explain your answer, okay? So um, that is the question about the court system. Any questions about that? I assume I could bring things into this topic like uh, the the courtroom work group or like the uh, theoretical like funnel that the criminal justice system works on. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, that, uh, I mean, when you answer the question of what the structure and the purpose of the court system is, you know, you could definitely say, well, the, the purpose is for trials, but that's actually kind of misleading because the vast majority of what happens in courts is not trials, right? Um, as we know, all the pre-trial activities in so few cases go to trial um, and appellate courts don't, aren't trial courts, right? So you can definitely bring in the courtroom work group, um, you know, the funnel um, to help us get, to help you answer what the purpose of the court system is in the United States. Because if you just say trials, that would actually not be a right answer. And right, people work in courts, right? So the courtroom work group works in the courts. So yeah, that's great. That that that's something you should definitely add. Uh, anything else on that? No, I think I understand that. Um, question three. I couldn't decide whether to do the prosecutor or the defense attorney, but just because we talked a lot about the prosecutor with locked in, so there's a little overlap here, but but that's okay. So this one is about describing the duties and responsibilities of the prosecutor. How are these different from the duties of the defense attorney? Uh, when it comes to charging an individual with a crime, the prosecutor, as we know, has a lot of discretion. I want you to explain why that they have that discretion. Uh, what is the purpose and consequence of prosecutorial discretion? Here, I would expect people to bring in stuff from locked in, obviously. And then the textbook lists four factors that prosecutors take into consideration when deciding whether to proceed with the case. So we talked about that there's case factors, system factors, political factors, et cetera. And so of these four factors, which two do you think are most likely to impact a prosecutor's charging decision? And again, there's no right or wrong answer to that, but it would, base, it would be a reflection of what you've learned about sort of like the, the way prosecutors do their job. And from locked in, we get a really good kind of look at that. And then do you think prosecutorial discretion is beneficial or detrimental to the system of criminal justice in the United States explain? And again, you can bring in stuff from the textbook from that, um, but also from locked in to answer that question as well. Okay, so that's the question on the prosecutor. Any questions about that? Uh, not really, I think I understand that well enough. Yes, that's pretty straightforward. Um, so four is about the trial. Um, stay, steps in the trial process. Hint, um, since you came to the, you know, the study session, the trial process starts with jury selection. A lot of times students are like, starts with opening arguments. Nope, the trial process starts with jury selection. So, you know, you want to identify and describe the steps in the trial process, starting with jury selection. Summarize, you know, you don't need to tell me everything that's in the textbook, but just, I'm just trying to get a sense of like, that you guys understand what happens in, in during the trial process. Okay. And of the steps, in, and so describe, summarize in that first prompt, but of the steps in the trial process, which two steps do you think are most crucial for ensuring a fair, a just and fair criminal trial? So um, I would expect a, a, a really solid argument to like say, well, jury selection, or you could say um, uh, 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 jury instructions, right, before they deliberate. You could say jury deliberation, right? Whatever you want it to be, but make some, pick two good steps, make two good arguments. Um, so, and, and there you can bring in uh, stuff from locked in, stuff from the textbook, from, stuff from lecture, et cetera. Anything there that you'd like that you, any questions? 
Um, no, not really. I think it's kind of straightforward. I mean, I pr I'm sure probably people who are watching the recording of this are going to have questions, but yes. I don't really have a lot of questions about the trial process and how we're going to write about it. Okay, right. It's pretty pretty straightforward. Um, this one has to do with uh, sentencing, and so. I've given you a hypothetical here, and um, then I want you to uh, apply what we've learned about sentencing to the hypothetical. I will let you read the hypothetical on your own. I mean, the hypothetical is about a woman who falls asleep in the, her van because she's drunk, and then somebody calls the cops on her. She's on the side of the street. You know, they saw her pull over, fell asleep drunk, call the cops, and then the cops um, arrest her for drunk driving and they take her in for booking. But then it turns out that her kid's in the back seat uh, asleep, a four-year-old, and it's cold and that, that she's either too drunk or whatever, incapacitated to tell the cops. And then the child's not found. This is actually based on a real case, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, the child is found when they tow the van to the tow empowerment center the next day. And um, it's a cold night in November. The kid's okay, I guess, yeah, the kid's okay, um, but they could have been harmed, okay? And then it, it says that there's a recommendation for sentencing that the prosecutor's made, making based on that this is two degrees of child endangerment, which is a felony. Um, and then the, the, the defense attorney uh, offers a different recommendation, okay? So I want you to take this hypothetical and then I want you to um, act like the sentencing judge and so uh, I want you to describe the sentence you would give this person. Uh, you have discretion. So just imagine you can give them whatever they want, right? There's not a mandatory or, or minimum or whatever. Um, although judges usually like will listen to what the prosecutor and the defense attorney say. And then we talked about the goals of sentencing, like incapacitation, rehabilitation, whatever. Um, and so I want you to explain you, what your sentence is and then explain two goals you hope to achieve with the sentence and then tell me whether or not this sentence would be determinant or indeterminate. I don't care about consecutive, consecutive or um, whatever the other one is. Uh, what's the other one? Consecutive and concurrent. You know, I don't, you don't need to include that. But do tell me if this should be an indeterminate or determinant sentence. And then tell me three factors you considered when imposing the sentence. Because uh, they talk about factors that sentencing judges can keep in mind when they're imposing the sentence. So that's kind of a fun question. I hope you do it. <laughs> uh, so what do you think? Any questions about that? Uh, no, I think that's entirely reasonable. A consecutive and con what was it again? I can't remember the name. I always get like tongue twisted. Right, so consecutive, consecutive and concurrent. That, like, that's it. It, and, I mean, since she's charged with two counts of child endangerment and I think account of uh, operating a vehicle while intoxicated. You could give her a year for op uh, the operating while intoxicated. You could give her three years for the first kind of <laughs> engagement and four years for the second. And if you serve those consecutively, you would go like one plus three plus four, and then you'd have to serve whatever that adds up to eight that's consecutive. Concurrent means it takes place at the same time. So you would just serve the maximum um, eight years of the sentence and that you would serve the first one year during your eight years, three years during your eight years. Don't worry about that though. But you would wanna tell me if it's indeterminate or determinant. Like, are you gonna sentence her to three to eight or a hard eight, right? Where there's that it's determinant, she has to serve all eight years or all two years or whatever the sentence is that you give her or whatever. If you don't sentence her to a inc incapacitation, then she, it, the indeterminate and determinate wouldn't matter. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think that makes sense. All right. And then the last one, I don't know if you watched the lectures or not, but I had my husband come in and talk about whether Pennsylvania or Auburn system. So that what the hell, I'll just throw this in as a question. Uh, so describe the Pennsylvania and Auburn prison system, compare and contrast these two systems. What are the goals of these different prison types? What values and assumptions regarding human nature are reflected in these systems? And so values are, you know, core beliefs. Uh, human nature is that, um, you know, that we make assumptions about like 
people's innate sort of like how they're born into this world, right? That people like have a human nature of cooperation. People have a human nature of um, uh, that they're immutable, that they, they're fixed, they can't be changed. You could say that human nature is that um, people can learn from their mistakes or, or that humans are just basically evil, you know, or whatever. So I'm not saying you use those, but those are just examples of human nature. So like when you're thinking about the Pennsylvania system, what assumptions are they making about the innate characteristics of humans? What are the assumptions that Auburn prison is making about the innate characteristics of humans? Um, and then which of the two systems that, in, which of the two is the system that informs corrections in the United States today? There's a right or wrong answer to that. Um, of these two, which do you think should be the system used in the United States? And then finally, if you are incarcerated, which would you rather be a uh, Pennsylvania or would you rather be housed in Pennsylvania system or in the Auburn system? No right answer, but explain your answer on that one. So if I remember correctly, your husband said that he'd rather, uh, I don't remember which system it was, but he said he'd be worried he'd be sleeping all day if I remember correctly. <laughs> right. He said that um, he would prefer Pennsylvania, but he was worried that if somebody wasn't telling him what to do all day long, that he would just take naps all day and that he wouldn't like ever be reformed. So he thought maybe he'd be too lazy. And so maybe he needs to the heavy hand of the state to like get him to actually achieve his rehabilitation goals. So I said, Pennsylvania, there's, I would be dead in the Auburn system, no doubt. So I would, I'd have to be alone in my cell because I'm sure I'd be beat up in prison or something. Who knows? Although I'm smart. So maybe I could like sell my smartness, uh, you know, for protection. So, well, hopefully I'll never have to answer that question, but you never know. Um, okay. So that's it. Do you have any questions on that one? Uh, no, I think I understand that. All right, cool. So I'm going to stop the share and um, are there any other things you want to talk about or were you able to get the court report paper done? I haven't uh, looked at those yet. Yeah, I got my court report done. One problem was that because of COVID, a lot of these like courtrooms aren't being really handled in person. Yes. I showed up thinking like, oh, this one's the only one in person I could find at the time, like a couple days before it started. And it turned out I was just in a room with the three like with the judge and two others and they were on their computers and I was just sitting awkwardly in the pews like listening. <laughs> All right, yeah. And, so and they, they looked they look questioning at me like what are you doing here and I was <laughs> like I, I explained to them after the meet after the uh the hearing that I had to that I was doing this for criminal justice. Right. Uh so were they helpful? Um, yeah, I mean, more or less. It was kind of a quick hearing. It was Capital One versus a citizen. I don't remember the name. I think it was William something. Okay. And I was think I was thinking it might be more interesting, but the uh, the person basically just uh, sent a memo. Didn't have a lawyer that said that just agreed to the charges. Oh. Okay. And that was it. It was so quick, and I was like, oh. Okay. It reminded me of a case where it wasn't really a case because uh, I don't think it got trialed in court, but there was a person who uh, cashed one of those bogus checks you get in the mail. Oh my goodness. You know, he actually, ca he successfully cashed it thinking it wouldn't work. And the bank ended up harassing him for months about why, like wanting the money back. And <laughs> legally he could, they couldn't get it back because that was their fault for doing it right um, i was hoping it'd be something like that because i was like oh capital one maybe it's like a credit card agency i speculated that in my thing that it was probably a credit card like company doing because during, during COVID, a lot of people are losing their jobs or yeah you know, overspending on their credit cards because they don't really have the opportunity to work or simply got laid off by their companies and well that's just what happens right well um, well, I look forward to reading the paper and hopefully you had enough to like write about. So that, that will be good. Somebody just turned out about what I could there. So. Could you guys mute that? Everything, all, all things have gone south. Um, all right. Well, any other questions or concerns? Um, no, I think that's fine. Well, actually, it's it said that it was available after this at two o'clock. Yeah, I'm just going to open make... it. Oh, yeah, sorry. I'm just making sure it's not, I, I saw it wasn't due today. I'm just making sure that that's correct. It's not due today necessarily. It's just over multiple days. Like we could. Yeah, exactly. Day. So um, I have it calibrated so that it opens at, a, like nobody can access it until 2 p.m. Although actually after I, we get off the, the study session, I'm going to just open it at that point. But then you have until Monday to complete it and um, 
uh, submit it to assignment. Um, so, right, you will have access to it today and then it's not due until Monday at 11.59 p.m. on, on um, May 17th. I want to make sure the format of this, this isn't going to be like a, is it going to be one of those like tests where it effectively just gives you the uh, the questions and you could answer it in thing, or is it going to be we have the questions available at two p.m. and we could take the time to write the paper outside of that? And then oh turn yeah, it no, no, I'm no, not no. exactly it's, sure it's how a, that works. Yeah, it's a Word document that you download, and then you work on the Word document. It's not like timed or anything. So okay. it's a Word document you download, um, and then you work on that on your own time, and then then you upload that Word document. After All right. you, like put the answers in it or whatever. All right, that sounds fine. I was making sure because I was worried I would have to like write uh, up to eight pages of of work in like no, two no. hours. No, 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 no. It's just you download the document, then you work on it, and then you just need to get it uploaded by um by Monday at midnight. All right then. All right, cool. Well, thanks for coming to the study session. All right then. Have a nice day. Okay, you too. Bye bye.